Okay, once again, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this seminar uh, on the book of uh, Zechariah, conducted by uh, Dr. Leong Genpo. Okay, let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Leong. Dr. Leong Genpo is a research director of Malaysia Campus Crusade for Christ. His research focus is on applying the Old Testament to the church and the world today. This has culminated in his book, Our Reason for Hope, an exposition of the Old Testament on the meaning of history. He has an MA in Old Testament studies from Wheaton College and a PhD in ancient Near Eastern languages and cultures from the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Leong has been speaking to us a number of times. And the last one was exactly one year ago, also via Zoom. So uh, without further ado, I now invite him to speak to us. Dr. Leong, please. Good evening. Good evening. Well, it is well known that the Old Testament is uh, much neglected today. And in the Old Testament, the prophetic books are more neglected. And of the prophetic books, the minor prophets are even more neglected. And uh, Zechariah is one of the minor prophets. And minor prophets are well known to be difficult to understand. So if you have read through Zechariah and found it difficult to understand, then you are not alone. Because even Bible scholars find it difficult to understand Zechariah. If you pick up a commentary, the commentator may, right in the beginning, confess that he found this book difficult to understand. Actually, scholars, Bible scholars, Old Testament scholars should not find Zechariah difficult to understand because that is their profession. That is the calling. Studying the Old Testament is their work. How come even those who write commentaries on Zechariah find it difficult to understand? Well, the reason is simple as I look at how they try to read and interpret Zechariah. So I will try to overcome the reason why they find Zechariah difficult. So it will make Zechariah much more understandable than otherwise. So I will approach Zechariah with three principles in mind. Number one, we will look at Zechariah as a coherent book. In other words, even though there are different prophecies spoken at different times, but it has one common message, it's coherent. In other words, one part will have to interpret another part. Bible scholars find Zechariah difficult because when they look at one part of Zechariah, they read it in isolation and try to make sense of what he's saying. And that is very difficult. And they will end up with speculation. Who is he talking about? And so on. Secondly, another principle is that we will look at the Bible, the Old Testament, and the prophetic books as coherent. In other words, the Bible is a coherent book. The Old Testament is a coherent book, and the prophetic books are coherent. In other words, we can use the other prophetic books and the Old Testament and the New Testament to help us understand Zechariah. And I think for you, I thought this is already taken for granted. Yeah, but this is not how the Bible scholars operate. They don't study Zechariah with these assumptions that Zechariah is coherent, the Old Testament is coherent, the prophetic books are coherent, and the New Testament can help us understand the Old Testament, including Zechariah. So, for us, I think there is no controversy that this is the proper approach to Scripture because Zechariah is Scripture, the Word of God, part of the Word of God. The Word of God is coherent. It has a unified message concerning Jesus Christ. So, this is the assumption we will use as we look at the book of Zechariah later on. But another thing, about uh, the prophetic books in general and uh, tonight, Zechariah in particular, is this. The prophets 
often when they talk about the coming of the Messiah, they do not distinguish between the first and second coming. In fact, most of the time when you read the prophetic books, there is no indication that the Messiah will come twice. It is very clear in the New Testament after Christ has come the first time, and then he didn't fulfill everything that is talked about him in the Old Testament, and he will come back in the second time to fulfill what has not been fulfilled. There is prophesy about him in the Old Testament. But when you read the prophetic books, they often collapse the two coming of the Messiah or Christ as though it's one event. We'll come back to this later on in Revelation to Zechariah. So we have to bear this in mind when, as we read Zechariah, we will look through, in fact, we'll look at every chapter, not the whole thing, of course, we are kind of a turning points, important uh, passages from each of the chapters. We will bear these three things in mind. We will interpret Zechariah, whatever passage we are looking at, in light of other passages in Zechariah. And we look at Zechariah in light of the prophetic books as a whole, the Old Testament as a whole, and in light of the New Testament. And remember, the prophets, even at times, Zechariah does not distinguish between the first and second coming of Christ. So when we look at a text concerning the coming of Christ or the Messiah, and what happens after his coming? We have to kind of ask ourselves, has this been fulfilled in his first coming? Because he has come. He has fulfilled many things mentioned about him in his first coming. So we will look back and say, oh, this has been fulfilled. And what has not been fulfilled will be at the second coming. So these are the three principles we will use in reading Zechariah. In fact, these are the three principles we should use in reading any prophetic books. So we will see this illustrated in Zechariah. Now, Zechariah is a post-exilic prophet, meaning he prophesied after the exile to a community of Jews who had returned from Babylon. If you remember, in 586 BC, Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the people were exiled into Babylon. And in 538 BC, they returned under the Persian government. Cyrus allowed them to return. So a group of them returned to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem. They began by rebuilding the temple. After they built the altar and the foundation, they faced some opposition and they stopped building. They stopped building for 18 years. The temple of God was very important to the Jews because that was how God dwelt with them. God's presence will be manifested in and through the temple. They stopped building. Then Haggai came and preached to them after 18 years to challenge them to rebuild the temple. And they obeyed the voice of God through Haggai. And God said, I will be with you and stirred up the spirit to make them willing to rebuild. You see, when they obeyed, they, were not, they don't feel like it, but God made them feel like it after they obeyed. Now, two months later, Zechariah began to preach. You see, they obeyed the voice of God through Zechariah within three weeks. And then that means another one month and one week or so, Zechariah started preaching. So this is the historical context. So let's look at the first text. We will have the slides. Now, chapter 1, verse 3 to 6 kind of introdu introduces the book of Zechariah and present the purpose of the book of Zechariah. Uh, this is from the ESV, chapter 1, verse 3 onwards. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. Now, here. Zechariah began by reminding them 
of what the former prophets of Jeremiah preached to their forefathers before the exile. The, four, the prophets preached to the forefathers saying, repent from your evil ways. Then you will remain in this place. Otherwise, you go to exile. They refuse to listen. So what happened? As God has said so, they were taken into exile to Babylon. And now, some of them and their descendants have returned. And they have started rebuilding the temple and Zechariah is speaking to them. Saying, remember what happened? God's word spoken to your forefathers. They refused to obey. What happened to them? God's word overtook them. They overtook them. In other words, God's word came true. They did not believe it. They did not believe the good exile. But they did. Jerusalem was destroyed. Temple was destroyed. So God's word overtook them. And he's using this to help them that realize that God's word will always come true. What God has said will always come true. And from verse 6 onwards, Zechariah is going to talk about the future. Their future. In fact, some of the future is our past. You see, their future includes the first coming of Christ. So from now onwards, Zechariah is talking about the future. But he's using the past to help them to believe the future. Look at the past. God's word came true. Even though your forefathers did not believe, they did not reject God's word, but God's word overtook them. So therefore, as God is going to give them new revelation concerning the future, they have to realize that this word will also come to pass in the future. So Zechariah began by helping them to look at the past so that they will be able to believe what he's going to say about the future. Now, I will give you a quick overview about uh, the rest of Zechariah. Chapter 1, verse 7 onwards to chapter 6, verse 8. There are eight visions in one night, or you can say eight parts of a vision, because all occur in one night. There are eight parts or eight visions, and, if, and uh, it has a unified message. And after the vision, there is a symbolic action. Now, the vision is all in symbol, and the message is symbolic to the vision. Then after the vision, there is a symbolic action. You may have heard of this before. And after that, there is a Q&A because a group came to ask the leadership and Zechariah answered them. There's a Q&A in chapter 8 and 9. Uh, chapter 7 and 8. Then 9 to 14 is the revelation concerning the coming of the Messiah. And that Six chapters are the most difficult part of Zechariah if we do not follow the three principles I mentioned early on. Okay, so now we want to look at the eight visions. Now, uh, to overview Zechariah, we have to look at the parts. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. I cannot just sum up everything because, for example, the eight visions. So we will quickly run through the eight visions, highlight what they're all about and what is the message. Let's look at the first, the first vision. Next slide. Now, the, in the first vision, Zechariah saw riders on horses. And what are they? And this is the answer. And they answered the angel of the Lord and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, again which you have been angry these 70 years? And the Lord answered, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am ex ex exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry, but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built. In it, and the measuring line shall be stretched over Jerusalem. My city shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So, this is about the future of Jerusalem. So, the riders on horses, they are sent to patrol the earth, and this is the report. They say, as they patrol the earth, they found that 
the nations, including those nations that send the Jews into exile, are at ease. But Jerusalem is not at ease, still under control of the, the, the Persian Empire, and uh, they are still trying to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. They face opposition from the neighbors. So Jerusalem is not at peace. So the angel said, how long will God will be angry? 70 years now? The exile is over. 70 years over. They have come back. Why is Jerusalem not at ease, whereas the nations are at ease? And God gave, I'm jealous of Jerusalem. I will protect Jerusalem. I'm angry with the nations who are at ease. Now, this is a serious sign that God is going to do something for the nations who are, who are then at ease. He said, I will angry a little, but they're further disaster. That means that God allowed the nation to attack Jerusalem and send them in exile because God was angry with them a little. But they did more than what they're supposed to do. They were very cruel. So God will judge them. So he said, I have returned to Jerusalem. Good news to them. My house will be built. They are in the process of building. And now God said it will be built, promising them it will be completed. Not the last time. They stopped halfway. And the measuring line will be over Jerusalem, meaning Jerusalem will be rebuilt. At this point, Jerusalem was still rebuilt. The wall was not rebuilt yet. That was later when Nehemiah came. So the, the temple was being rebuilt. The city is being rebuilt. And God said it will be prosperous. Now, we will uh, pay, have, have the have this in our mind, this, this theme of Jerusalem being rebuilt. We are asked, has this already been fulfilled? Has Jerusalem been rebuilt in such a way that they have prosperity and so on? Okay, so this is the first vision. Let's move on to the second vision. Next slide. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah Israel and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four horsemen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nation who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter them. So the four horns refers to the nations that have scattered Jerusalem. And then there are four craftsmen. Who are they? They are to terrify, to cast down the horn. In other words, they are to overcome the horns. God will use them to bring down the horns, the nations, including those who have scattered the Jews. Now, who are the craftsmen? Now, the word craftsman in Hebrew is used for the builder of the tabernacle and the builders of the temple. Now, in the context of Zechariah, remember? God just said, my temple, my house shall be rebuilt. And the, con the bigger context, they were in the process of rebuilding the, te the temple. So in other words, these four craftsmen are the four temple builders. Four to counteract it. Four. Now, all these are symbols, you see. They are symbolic. So we have to interpret the symbol. So the four craftsmen are temple builders. So God will use temple builders to cast down the nations. Wow, think about that. God is going to use soldiers, weapons, but use temple builders. What does that mean? Now, the temple is where God dwelt and where he reigned. His throne is in the temple. He reigned over Israel and over the nation from the temple. So building the temple has the idea of establishing God's reign in a tangible way, in a practical way. Of course, God reigns all the time, but God works through human means. Now, for us, now I can't, I can't help but give a very quick application here because it's so beautiful. Today, the church, we have no temple. The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we are the temple. So when we make disciples, we build God's temple. We are God's temple builders. And that means, as we make disciples of all nations, as we build God's temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, this will bring down the nations. So this is to show the application now. We, we, we do not have time to develop this into the sermon. So this is to show us how God eventually 
will work in this world is in and through his people. Now we turn to the next vision now. And I lifted my eyes and saw a man with a measuring line in his hand to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. Now they built on what is mentioned just now about measuring line, about rebuilding Jerusalem. So this elaborate on the rebuilding Jerusalem part. And what is amazing is, it says Jerusalem shall be inhabited without, as villages without walls. See, in an ancient city, they always have walls. Because of the nature of the ancient world, to protect the city. To say Jerusalem will be villages without walls is something unusual. Why without walls? Because there are so many people, multitude of people. Later, we will see that this will include Gentiles becoming part of Jerusalem. And God said, I will be a fire wall around them. God will protect them. No. And I will be in the midst. Now, what is Jerusalem here about? Okay? We will, we will try and trace this. Has this been fulfilled? How is this fulfilled? Is it fulfilled the first coming or the second coming of Christ? Okay? So, bear in mind the theme of Jerusalem. Now, that's the next slide. We're still in the same vision. Okay? Now. Still the same vision. Up, up, flee from the land of the north. Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory, send me to the nations who plundered you. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. And you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves with the Lord in that day and shall be my people and I will dwell in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you and the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Now, I, I quickly note that you see, we see twice that you will know the Lord of hosts has sent me twice here. This is repeated a number of times in Zechariah. In other words, Zechariah God is concerned about affirming Zechariah as the prophet of God when what he prophesied comes true. Okay, we will not dwell on that further. Okay, here it gives a bigger picture about the Jerusalem I mentioned just now. Other nations will come and join themselves and will be called my people. Gentiles will be part of Jerusalem that Jerusalem that God said he will build. Villages without war and God will protect and God will dwell within their midst. Now, what is the meaning of Jerusalem here? Has this Jerusalem been rebuilt? Has this Jerusalem been fulfilled? Of course, when they are, they are building Jerusalem, especially when uh, Nehemiah came to rebuild the wall, the physical Jerusalem, did the physical Jerusalem rebuilt by Nehemiah later until the coming of Christ fulfill this? No. Since the exile and the return, Jerusalem had no peace. Until today, Jerusalem had no peace. Has this been fulfilled by the first coming of Christ? That Jerusalem is rebuilt? Without, wall, without, without walls, villages, because too many people, even the nation Gentiles will join themselves in the Jerusalem and God will dwell in the midst. So let's ask ourselves, has this been fulfilled? If we say, it's either the first coming or the second coming of Christ. Or both. Okay, now. I will say, it has begun to be fulfilled. And when the apostles went and preached the gospel, they fulfilled the Great Commission. 
and make disciples of all nations, where the nations become God's people. In other words, this Jerusalem that is talking about, that Zechariah is talking about, without walls, you know, the idea without walls shows us that, you know, he's, he's thinking of a, a different kind of Jerusalem, a city. You know, the, the one that Nehemiah came back to rebuild had walls. This had no walls. And God will protect them. And Gentiles will join them. So in other words, this Jerusalem is actually the church. It has been fulfilled as the church grows. That is the Jerusalem that's been rebuilt. And at the second coming of Christ, the new Jerusalem, which is also called the bride of Christ, the church, will be completed. completed. In other words, this building of Jerusalem starts with the first coming of Christ and continue to be built and completed at the second coming of Christ. This is how to make best sense of this text because this is God's word. It has to be fulfilled. And we have to look at how it is fulfilled. We have to use the New Testament to understand what it is. Okay, now, as we move on, you will see that this interpretation, understanding of this Jerusalem will become clearer and clearer and more and more sensible. Okay, look at the next vision. What vision? Now Joshua was standing before the angel. Now he was clothed with filthy garments. And uh, in earlier verse, Satan was accusing him. And this is a very well-known text. Joshua, the high priest, was clothed with filthy garments and signifying he was sinful. And Satan was accusing him. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. Now, this text is probably, this vision is probably one of the easiest to interpret in light of the New Testament. Now, Joshua is a high priest, and Christ came as a high priest. He had filthy garments, iniquity, and God said, change it, remove that and put on pure garment. The meaning is, I have taken iniquity away from you. And the high priestess represent God's people as a whole. And the underlying, the last two lines, I will bring my servant the branch. Now, if you try to understand this, in isolation, it doesn't make sense. What is the branch? But when you read it in light of Jeremiah, Isaiah, the branch refers to the Messiah. And it makes very good sense here. And they will remove iniquity of this land in one day. In other words, God will bring the branch, the Messiah, and remove the iniquity of this land, the sin of this land, in a single day. In a single day, God will remove the sin of this place. And of course, we now know that happens when Christ was crucified on the cross in one day. God took away the sin of the wall. Now, what is amazing here is verse 8. Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Now, these men who sat with Joshua, who are assigned, in the context of the high priest who will be his fellow priest, his high priest, the other priests, the priests were there to offer sacrifices so that their sins are forgiven. So in other words, they are signed. What sign is that? Because their activity is to bring about forgiveness of sin through the sacrifices. And now God said they are signed, a sign of removing sin, forgiveness of sin. And in this context, God said, I'll bring about the branch, the Messiah. So you see, Zechariah begin to combine the role of the Messiah, the branch, and the priest the role of king and priest. This will come into explicit expression in chapter 6. So here is a kind of prophecy concerning one day, the Messiah, the king, who will play the role of priest and bring forgiveness of sin. Now, 
For us, we look at this, oh, there's nothing new. We all know this already. But you have to remember, when it was first spoken to the people 500 years before Christ, this is mind-boggling news to them. It's unbelievable. Try and put ourselves in their shoes. 500 years before Christ, listening to these words, that the Messiah, the king will be praised and will take away iniquity in one day. But as unbelievable as it was to them, it has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So this concerned the Joshua the high priest. The next vision, chapter 4. The next slide, we will look at another vision. This concerns Jeroboam. So in this vision, Zechariah saw a lamb stand with seven with branches with seven lambs. And they call the menorah. You know, you may have seen a picture of this, the lamb stand in the tabernacle. So there's this big lamb stand with the seven lambs. And there are two olive trees by the side. And the olive trees are piped linked to the lamb stand through pipes. Oil is flown. Uh, run into the lampstand. In other words, the, the oil is the fuel for the lampstand to the olive oil. So there's no need for external supply of oil. The two olive trees will supply the oil. And what's the meaning of this? Here we have it. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Jeroboam, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Very famous text. Says a lot of hosts, who are you, O great mountain? Before Jeroboam, you shall become a plain. The hands of Jeroboam have laid the foundation of this house, the temple. His hands shall also complete it. And you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. These two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstands are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now let's look at further up first before we look at the two anointed ones. Now this very famous quote, not by might, but by power, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In this context, it's about rebuilding the temple. In other words, whatever great mountain that is stand before Jeroboam, whatever obstacle shall become a plain, nothing can stop Jeroboam from finishing rebuilding the temple. So the theme of the temple comes in. We saw Jerusalem, now the theme of the temple shall be completed. Then you'll know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Okay, so it's not by power, not by might, but my spirit. In other words, the temple will be rebuilt. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. What does that mean? That's where the lower part comes in. The two olive trees, they supply oil to the lampstand. So that the lampstand, the lamps will keep burning, representing perhaps God's presence with them. God's empowering presence in them. Now are the two anointed ones. The two olive trees are the two anointed ones. One on the left and on the right. Who are they? Now, most translation as this one, ESV say the anointed ones. But I put, a, I put a footnote. This footnote is from the ESV itself. The translator put this footnote. In Hebrew, it says two sons of new oil. It doesn't say anointed one. Two sons of new oil. Another one is their interpretation. And it happens to be a wrong interpretation. In other words, most translation interpret it wrongly. Two sons of new oil, and I like this footnote, new oil. You see, when the, the oil used to anoint people, it's a different word. It's refined oil. Here is fresh oil, oil they squeeze out. Then olive oil is refined, made into oil that is used for anointing. So, so this is a different word. That's why the translator put new oil. So this oil is not for anointing. So, so it doesn't make sense to, 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 to say sons of an, anointed ones. The word sons of new oil, the way the Hebrew express it, has the idea of supplier of new oil. It supplies the new oil. In other words, this olive tree supplies the oil for burning, not for anointing. It makes sense because they are piped to the lampstand to burn. So, 
what do they represent then? Translated as anointed ones, they are usually understood as Zerubbabel and the high priest because uh, Zerubbabel represents governor, king is anointed one, and the high priest anointed one. But when we don't read it as anointed ones, as sons of oil, as suppliers of oil to fuel the lampstand, then we have more options. And what, who are the most likely candidates who stand by the Lord and who supply oil to keep the lampstand going, keep the, the power going? They are the two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. Now I have quoted 7, 12 here. That shows even in Zechariah itself, there's a connection between the Spirit of God and His prophets. Here the law and the words of the Lord of hosts had sent by His Spirit to the former prophets. So it makes sense to see the two sons of new oil, the source of oil, the source of power, as the two prophets, because the two prophets are empowered by the Spirit. They preach spirit inspired word. Now, you recall, I mentioned briefly just now, when for 18 years, they stopped building the temple because they put the wrong priority. They put priority on their luxurious house rather than on rebuilding the temple. So they stopped for 18 years. But when Zechariah preached and they heard the preaching, they obeyed. And when they obeyed, God said, I'm with you and God aroused their spirit. They didn't feel like doing it when they obeyed. They just know God has spoken, so they obeyed. And God aroused them so that they become willing to do it. God empowered them to go and rebuild the temple. So here is in the context of rebuilding the temple. So it makes sense that, and Zechariah is, is complementing and supplementing the preaching of Haggai to encourage them, empower them to go on rebuilding the temple and beyond that. So the two Olive trees are the prophets. Now, combine this with the temple builders. Remember? The craftsmen, the temple builders. God is going to use the building of his temple to bring down the nations. And here are the prophetic words that will empower the temple builder, the craftsmen, the preaching of God's word. Now, we look at it in the context of the church. God will use his people as the church to make disciples of all nations, ultimately to rule the world. And it is through the preaching of his word, they will empower this, the making of the disciples. Through this symbolic message, we have a beautiful message from Zechariah. You see, the different visions are, are different parts of a puzzle. To, together, it gives a coherent message. So now we, we move on to the next vision. Vision number six. In this vision, Zechariah saw a large scroll, big scroll, fine. And uh, this scroll has words written on both sides of the scroll. And you'll see what is written on either side of the scroll. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side. And everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and he shall enter the house of the thief, and the house of him who swear falsely by my name. And he shall remain in the house and consume it, both timber and stones. So this scroll, flying scroll, on one side, condemns the one who swears. On the other side, condemns the one who steals. In other words, uh, we, we know this from the Ten Commandments, right? So the one who steals, thou shalt not steal, is written on one side, one tablet, the tablet put on the ten, uh, put in the Ark of the Covenant that uh, God gave Moses, and you shall not bow false witness on the other side. In other words, it summarizes the Ten Commandments. In other words, this scroll represents the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments will go out. It will be a curse to those who violate it and refuse to repent. 
So they will be cursed and cleaned out. You will go to the house. They will experience the curse and be cleaned out. So this concern, what is God going to do in the future? Then we look at the next vision to see whether the meaning of this. In this vision, he saw a woman in the basket. And I said, what is it? He said, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the laden weight on his opening. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, Where are they taking the basket? He said to me, To the land of China, that is Babylon, to build a house there. So just now we saw that the Ten Commandments will go and curse and clean out people who violate the Ten Commandments. Now, wickedness, iniquity will be put in the basket and taken to Babylon where it belongs, taken away. Now this reflects what we saw just now, that God will remove the iniquity in one day. Now this is symbolic in a graphic way. On one hand, Iniquity will be taken care of, will be removed. But those who sin and will repent will be cursed and cleaned out. So you can see we have a very spiritual message here from the, as Christian, we can see very clearly uh, what he's talking about. Because Christ has come and fulfilled, begin to fulfill this whole thing. Okay, let's look at vision Number seven, uh, number eight, the last vision. In this vision, Zechariah saw four chariots. Now, not riders on horses. Riders on horses, they were just patrolling. This one is patrolling, but chariot, chariots are war. The equivalent of tanks today. So there are four chariots with horses of different color. An angel answered and said to me, these are going out to the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses go towards the north country and the white ones go after them, go to the north country also. And the dapper one goes towards the south country. There is one group, the red ones, no mention where they're going, maybe they're on reserve. Then they cried to me, behold, those who are going to the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. Now, North Country refers to Babylon as here. You see, uh, the, 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 the geography of the place is such that to the, to the east of Israel is desert. So then Babylon, when they come to Israel, they will go north and come down. So Israel's enemies are either from the south Egypt or from the north. Assyria, Babylon will come from the north. And of course, their enemies are also the neighbors near them. So the North Country here refers to Babylon here. Those who uh, capture Israel and the horses, the black one and the white one, two batches of horses go to the North and have set my spirit at rest in the North Country. Now, I put the asterisk there to show, this is the ESV translation, put my spirit at rest. Look at how other Bible translation renders it. The Holman, Christian Center Bible have pacified my spirit. The New American Center Bible have appeased my wrath. The NLT, New Living Translation, wanted the anger of my spirit. You know, have set my spirit at ease. You know, too tame, too literal. But here we know that these are war chariots. And you read it in the context of later texts about God punishing the nations about God re removing iniquity and so on. I have pacified my spirit, appeased my wrath, vented anger, makes better sense, this translation. In other words, for God's iniquity to be taken away, the curse 
must be on the people who do not repent and uh, clean out so that God's anger can have peace. So when Christ died on the cross, God's anger was a peace. There's a technical term called propitiation. And I'm aware that in more recent years, this doctrine is not very popular anymore. People find it very hard to see how God, his anger needs to be a peace. People who find it difficult to understand, basically, I would say, don't understand the holiness of God. God is so holy. God's wrath, I, I'm not sure I mentioned this in our last, last year's study on Zephaniah and uh, Joel. God's wrath is what happens when His holiness encounters sinfulness and His mercy is withheld. God's wrath is not an attribute of God. The attribute behind God's wrath is His holiness. God is so holy. When uh, the two sons of uh, Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, when they, they were in the presence of God, they offer, offer incense that is not prescribed, they drop dead. Ananias, Sapphira, in the New Testament, when they lie to the Holy Spirit, they drop dead because God is so holy. When God's holiness encounters man's sinfulness, and when His mercy is withheld, wrath is what happens. And that love has to be a peace. If sin is to be taken care of, once and for all, and Christ bore that love. Okay, so these are the eight visions. Now, I have kind of uh, gone through it linearly so that we can follow the flow, not topically, but we may not have enough time to try and look at it topical, like we look at Jerusalem, look at temple, and so on. But I hope that in your own minds, you begin to try and piece together topically. Now, before we move on to take a break and move on to chapter 9, look at 7 and 8 very quickly. Look at chapter 7. Oh, for, oh sorry, there's one more. Oh, this very important one, actually. Yeah, this one. Oh, yeah, chapter 7. This one is the symbolic action I mentioned after the vision. There's a symbolic action. So this is not, this is not, uh, in, in a, uh, vision anymore. Zechariah was actually asked to go and crown Joshua the high priest, take silver gold and make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua the son of Jehoshadak the high priest, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is Branch, again, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor and shall sit and rule on his throne, and they shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Priest and king will be at peace. And those who are far off shall come and have to build the temple of the Lord, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, this will build on what I mentioned just now. Now, just now we already saw the high priest, how God removed iniquity, symbolized by change of the garments. His dirty, filthy garments is changed by pure garments and the coming of the branch. Here is no longer in the vision. Here is actual crowning, symbolic, of course. What does that mean? It's very obvious. The branch is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He will also be the high priest. Priest and kingship come together. Now, this should not be strange even to an Old Testament person because why? Psalm 110 already said, Psalm 110 is about the Messiah. It is the most, one of the most, in fact, the most quoted Psalm in the New Testament. And in Psalm 110 verse 4, it says, that person, the Messiah, shall become a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So already in Psalm 110, there is already that presentation of the Messiah as priest, but not from the Levite because from Melchizedek, because the Messiah is from Judah. Priest has to be from the Levites, but he is not a priest according to the Levite order, but the order of Melchizedek. So become king and priest. So this 
put together. Uh, what, what is of special interest for us here is, he shall build a temple. Now he's taken the role of Jerubabel. And the, those of Fowl shall help to build a temple. Now is it going to be a literal temple? Because the Messiah shall build a temple. The temple has been built by the Jews. So it is another temple, not the one they are building. So in the same way, the Jerusalem they talk about that I mentioned just now, it's not the Jerusalem they are building, it's another Jerusalem. So you combine the two pictures, the Jerusalem and the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the new Jerusalem is also called the bride of Christ. The church is also the new Jerusalem. So merging together. So you see, as I mentioned just now, as we move on, you see clearer and clearer. What Zechariah is talking about is when the Messiah comes, Gentiles will be added to the Jerusalem, the church, the temple of the Holy Spirit, which Christ built and we have built. So he's talking about the church. For a long time, I thought, and for many people think that the Old Testament is silent on the church. From first coming and then jump over the second coming. No mention about what happened in between. Here we can see Zechariah is talking about the church. From his beginning, last year we studied Joel. He was founded when the Holy Spirit came. On the day of Pentecost, and 120 of them spoke in a language they never learned. They prophesied in a language they never learned. That was the building, beginning of this building of this Jerusalem and this temple that we are reading about in these visions and finally in this symbolic action. So this is all prophesied by Zechariah 500 years before Christ came. Okay, so now. 7 and 8, as I mentioned, is Q&A. Look at chapter 7. A group, they are people who have been there. Apparently, they were not taken into exile. You see, they were, they were people left behind by Babylonians. They were there. So they lived there for 70 years. And they have been fasting when uh, the people in exile. So now, they realize that the temple is about to be finished. So the exile is over. So they want to find out whether they should continue fasting or not. And this is what happened, the answer. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Say to all these other people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh, for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? Were not these words, were not these the words that the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous with the cities and around her? And the south and the lowland were inhabited. That is before the exile. This is, was it not what God said? Render true judgment, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. He's probably referring to Isaiah chapter 58. So the people fasted. But on the same day they fasted, they perpetrated injustice. God said, is that the fast I want? God said, I want to listen to you. So now these people have been fasting for 70 years. And now they ask whether they should stop fasting or not because now Jerusalem, is been, the temple has been rebuilt, exile is over. And God, before answering them, God answered them in chapter 8. Before answering them, gave them a lecture on uh, true fasting. He says, why do you fast? Are you fasting for me? If you fast for me, the fast I want should be backed up by true judgment, kindness, mercy. Do not oppress the widow. Fasting is useless unless it comes of a heart that is repentant. So this is just a side, side line, side thing, you know. But it's important for us to understand. There are people who fast today, understand the true meaning of fasting. So, so, so God's answer comes in chapter 8. That's next slide. Basically, God says, it's no longer a time for fasting, it's a time for rejoicing in light of what God's going to do to the coming of the Messiah, the branch, who will also be the priest. And God reaffirmed this kind of summarizes what we have been seeing 
in the eight visions. And the Lord, and the word of the Lord of hosts came saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous of Zion with great jealousy, and, and I am zealous for her with great wrath. I have returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, the holy mountain, as a purpose to bring this disaster to you when your fathers provoked me to wrath. And I did not relent. So again, have I purpose in these days to bring good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. In those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of a, the rope of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Well, this kind of summarize. One day, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. Now, again, by now we should realize that this Jerusalem is not the, the physical Jerusalem that they built. This holy mountain. What I want to highlight here is this. God say, I purpose to bring disaster to your fathers because they provoked me to wrath. I did not relent. What he said, he did not relent concerning judgment, disaster. So now he's, God said, I propose now blessing, redemption to Jerusalem. I will similarly not relent. You see, this explains why right in the beginning, God wants them to be reminded of how the, prophet, the words of the prophets, God's word through them, caught up with their fathers. In the same way, this is to encourage them that the words of God that has been spoken now in the visions concerning Jerusalem, the future of Jerusalem and God's people, will similarly be relentlessly fulfilled. Just as God did not relent in terms of judgment, God will not relent in terms of fulfillment of the blessings. The purpose in this day to bring good to Jerusalem. Now again, this Jerusalem, as I mentioned, is being rebuilt. The church, and one day will become the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22, when Christ come back. It has it, it is being fulfilled. Gentiles came to know Christ through Jews, beginning, especially for us, Paul. And I'm jealous for Jerusalem with great wrath. We will see why this great wrath comes into this picture. Why, why his jealousy for Jerusalem, his redemption to Jerusalem involved great wrath. Not wrath on Jerusalem, that is past. But why great wrath? Keep this in our mind so that uh, uh, when I talk about this, you, you recall if it's in this passage. Okay? Now, we have uh, covered chapter 1 to 8. Chapter 9 to 14 is something very different. So much so that there are scholars who say it is written by a different person and their commentary, they are separate. 1 to 8 and 7 to 9, uh, 9 to 14, as though there are two different books. So, so we, we, we will take a break and, uh, and then come back. So we take a 10 minutes break, come back. We, 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 just, we will see how we have a Q&A, okay? So during this break, think about this. So we cover a lot of ground, the eight vision and so on, because otherwise we, we, we can't really grasp the message. So we have to cover the ground. So, and I, I hope you begin to piece in your mind the coherent message, the themes about Jer building Jerusalem, about the Messiah, about the temple and so on, they all come together, okay? So let's take a break. We come back at the... Uh, Nine, now it's nine o'clock, ten, nine, between nine, ten, and nine, fifteen. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Leong, uh, for the halfway <laughs> through this, uh, the book of Zechariah. Okay, we shall take a break here and then we come back, say, about nine, ten to nine, fifteen. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, then we, we will wait for Dr. Leong. Uh, okay. Thank you. Don't go off. You can uh, off your video, but uh, stay stay tuned. Huh? Thank you. Okay, let's regather.
before we move on to chapter nine, perhaps uh, if there is any question, urgent question that we have to take care of before we move on, anyone? Based okay. on the yeah, thank you this time for the Q and A. Yeah. If anybody wishes to uh, ask questions, uh, you can unmute. And then it will be better if you can show yourself so that yeah, uh, Dr. Leong will know who, who he's speaking to. Thank you. Yeah, it's open. Time is open uh, for Dr. Leong's uh, Q&A time. At this time, many clarification. Yes, anyone? Okay, then we wait for later on. That means uh, nothing to clarify. Uh, that's good news, I hope. Now, as you have seen, the way I interpreted chapter one to eight is in light of what Christ has accomplished in his first coming. If we don't look at it from that point of view, then you know it's hard to make sense of what the visions are about the building of Jerusalem, building of temple, and so on. So when we look at it through the perspective of the New Testament, that the church is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that the church one day will be that new Jerusalem, eventually become the new Jerusalem, then everything falls in place. It makes so much sense. And it has a very meaningful message for us. So in the same way, we are going to use the same perspective to look at chapter 9 to 14. I mentioned about scholars having uh, difficulty in understanding Zechariah's mainly chapter 9 to 14, especially chapter 11. Unlike the other prophets, where you can usually know what, what not only what they're talking about, what they're referring to. The problem with Zechariah 9 to 14 is, even if you know what they're talking about, you're not sure what they're referring to. So if we use the New Testament to help us, then everything falls in place. Okay, what we are going to look at uh, every chapter, and every chapter has a verse, a text that is quoted or alluded to by the New Testament. We will focus on those texts. We can't look at every text. It's too big a book for two hours, but we will highlight those texts that are either quoted or alluded to by the New Testament, and we see how it talks about Jesus Christ and what uh, he will accomplish. Okay, the first one, chapter 9. This is a well-known one. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a coat, a foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot of Ephraim and the war horse of Jerusalem. And the battle shall but the bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nation. His rule shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now we know at the triumphant entry, when Jesus was riding on a donkey, Matthew 21, 5, proclaiming himself to the Messiah, fulfilling this prophecy. Oh, go back to chapter 9. Not yet. Okay. So it's quoted by Matthew referring to the Messiah, the King is coming, the Messiah coming, so this outright. So, so people who say, don't know what he's talking about, they refuse to recognize that Matthew has already solved the problem for us, he's talking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So if you don't look at it from the New Testament, they are great. You know, imagine the commentator who say, it's Alexander the Great. Then it's so subjective. But when you understand it in light of the rest of Zechariah, Zechariah talk about the branch coming, you know, about the Messiah coming, and the Old Testament, and the Gospel talk about him as the Christ. So it's very clear. So when people who refuse to do that will find this text very difficult. So that's why I say it is not that difficult when we allow the rest of the Bible, especially New Testament, to help us understand. Okay? Now, look at it, look at it here. Talking about Jesus Christ, we know he will speak peace to the nations. This has to be the first coming, right? Because in the second coming, it will be judgment. And yet he will rule from sea to sea, ends of the earth. So he has begun to rule as the church grows 
throughout all the world. He has begun that. So this will again uh, amplify what we saw just now, that uh, the Messiah will come and he will rule. In peace now, then later on will be judgment. Okay, this is the first text. Second one, chapter 10. My anger is hot against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders, for the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic steed in battle. From him shall come the cornerstone, from him the ten pack, from him the battle bow, from him every ruler, all of them together. They shall be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe in the mud of the streets. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and they shall put to shame the riders on horses. Now, this is not peace anymore. It's, uh, you know, it's war. Now, highlighted the cornerstone. Who is this cornerstone? Shall come the cornerstone? Uh, we know it's a ruler. Here, ten pack, whatever, uh, better bow is about ruler. And they will fight like, uh, like a steed, a J16. So, now, we'll come back and perhaps look at whether this is about the second coming or the first coming, but who is the cornerstone? Next slide. It is not quoted directly in any New Testament, but look at Psalm 118 verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Then verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord, Matthew 21, 6. Remember, this is also cited in the triumphant entry. When Jesus was riding on a donkey in Jerusalem, the people saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, it's not a coincidence. The cornerstone. And here, blessed. And Matthew 21. Also in the context of the triumphant entry, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is, a mar and it is marvelous in his eyes. You see, during the triumphant entry, the cornerstone of Psalm 108 is cited and blessed is he who comes in the name is cited in the context of the triumphant entry, chapter 9. So the cornerstone of chapter 10 just now, we saw just now in Zechariah, refers to, again, the Messiah, indirectly. So chapter 10 also has a reference to the Messiah indirectly. But that's the language of battle. We'll come back to that. Let's move on. To the next slide. Chapter 11. And this is the most exciting one. So I became the shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. But I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give, uh, give me my wages. But if not, keep them. And they weighed out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter the lordly price at which I was prized by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Now this is, if we take it by itself, it's very, very confusing. Okay, what happened was, here, in a vision, God told Zechariah to shepherd the flock to be doomed. In a vision, that means Israel. The, the flock to be doomed. That means this flock is destined to be doomed. And yet God called Zechariah to shepherd this flock. Now it's symbolic. And as we read on, we know he's playing the role of the Messiah to shepherd the flock. flock. He's playing a symbolic role, taking the role of the Messiah, shepherd the flock, destined to be doomed. And then he stopped. I became impatient with them and they detested me. So he stopped being the shepherd. Do not be the uh, shepherd. He said, let them die. Those who are supposed to die, die, destroy, destroy. And those who didn't die, devour one another. Now, devour one another, as you shall see, is the language of exile. 
because it, because uh, in the Babylon exile, the, the Babylon surrounded the city, no food can go in, no one can come out, and they are hungry, they devour one another. They eat the flesh, it's recorded in Jeremiah. So, he played that role. And then, because uh, they, he stopped being the shepherd and they detested him, rejected him, he asked for wages. And they gave him 30 pieces of silver, which is the price of a, a slave that is uh, gone by all. In other words, a, a, a slave that is uh, uh, caused to die by negligence, hey, the price of a slave. And then the Lord asked Zechariah to throw it to the potter in the house of the Lord. Okay? What is the meaning of this? Now, first of all, note that Zechariah is playing role playing. He played the role of the shepherd. Then he played the role of the one who threw the 30 pieces of silver into the temple to the potter. And the uh, the Lord, the shepherd, was priced at 30 pieces of silver. Now, now look at the next text, which will help us understand what it is all about. Next slide. Without this, we will not be able to make sense of what we read just now in chapter 11. Matthew 27, verse 5, about Judas. He betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and then when Christ uh, was arrested, he, he regretted, he felt guilty. He went and threw the piece of silver into the temple. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them to the potter's field as the Lord directed. Now, first of all, Matthew say that uh, the 30 pieces of silver thrown into the temple fulfilled what Zechariah 11, okay? Now, without this, we have no idea what that is about. But with this, we know it has been fulfilled. Zechariah played the role of the Messiah to shepherd the flock. He did shepherd the flock. But they rejected him. And Judah betrayed him, prized him at 30 pieces of silver. Price him at 30 pieces of the silver. And he threw the 30 pieces of silver into the temple. And they used the money to buy the potter's field. So this helps us understand what it means by throwing the pieces of silver into the house of the Lord to the potter. No one has been able to figure out what it meant by to the potter in Zechariah 11. But Matthew helped us. They bought the potter's field. Okay? So, I trust Matthew. Some people have problem with how the New Testament quote the Old Testament. They say it's out of context. But this one is one of those they say out of context. One reason they say is, well, in Zechariah 11, it was Zechariah the Messiah that threw, not Judas. Well, they're confused. Zechariah can play the role of more than one. He can play the role of the Messiah, play the role of the one who threw need not be the same person. So what happened is, you see, when God used symbolic action, for example, God uh, asked uh, Ezekiel to demonstrate the exile, take a piece of brick and then write on it, Jerusalem, and then do a six, six machine. You know, symbolic action. He's not going to do it, but he's talking about what will happen. So, Zechariah 11, the symbolic action of Zechariah playing the role of the Messiah, the shepherd, and rejected by the uh, price of the disciple, he played that role. Then throwing it, it may not be the same person. He seems saying that this is what happened. 30 pieces of silver will be thrown into the temple to the portal. 
Okay, so now we have it. What it means by through the portal, to buy the portal seal. So without Matthew, we cannot figure out what it means by through the portal, through a temple and then end up to the portal, to the portal seal. There's a major problem here. Here, Matthew says, spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, not Zedekiah. Uh, Zechariah, prophet Jeremiah, not Zechariah. So again, say, quote out of context. He seems uh, confused. Uh, Zechariah, Jeremiah with Zechariah. Is it? Well, well, we have to go out of uh, Zechariah to solve this problem. Did Matthew make a mistake by saying, Spoken by the prophet Jeremiah when he was Zach, Zechariah, they said the 30 pieces. We saw the first problem, the meaning. Now, the attribution. Who actually said that? Well, first of all, Matthew is concerned about the buying of the field, the potter's field, for a better place for stranger. Okay? You see? Not just the throwing into the temple, the buying. Now, why Jeremiah? Look at the next slide. Next slide. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 19. God asked Jeremiah to visit the potter. And then buy a flask and then break the flask representing the, the destruction of Jerusalem. Because the people have forsaken me and have profaned this place by making offerings in it to, their, to other gods. And because they have filled this place with blood, the blood of innocence, Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when this place shall be no more called Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and their daughters, and everyone shall eat the flesh of his neighbor in the siege. Remember just now I mentioned about eating flesh? Men shall bury in Topheth because there will be no place else to bury. In other words, God said, because they have rejected God, worship idols, and refuse to repent. That place shall no longer be called the, the, the normal name, Valley of the Son of Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter, fuel of blood. And they go into exile. And in the siege, they will eat the flesh of the sons and daughters and eat the flesh of the neighbor. So it's a prediction exile. In other words, Jeremiah here is predicting the Babylonian exile because they have rejected God. And as a result of that, that field which the priest bought field of uh, Potter's field, it's the same field. Jeremiah is talking about the same place. Shall become the valley of slaughter or field of blood and shall bury people. The, high, the priest bought the place to bury strangers. So in other words, there is a precedent here concerning the exile. That because they rejected God, they were going to exile. And that place will be called the valley of slaughter or the field of blood. So Jeremiah, uh, Matthew must be thinking of this verse of how because they rejected Christ, Pricing a 30 pieces of silver, the money is used to buy the field, the field of blood, and to bury. So there's a precedent. So what happened is this. Zechariah was combining two sets of prophecy. The first one concerning the 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah. The second one concerning the field, the field of blood, buying the field of blood into one prophecy. So what is being fulfilled? Basically, it's the prediction in uh, Zechariah because Zechariah predicted that the Messiah will be rejected, priced at 30 pieces, and the 30 pieces will be thrown into the temple, to the portal. And Jeremiah part is the meaning of to the portal. They will use the money to buy the porter's field because they rejected the Messiah. Jeremiah here is about when they rejected God, that field will be called a valley of slaughter, field of blood, and used to bury people. And in the context of exile, as you'll see, the rejection of Messiah will also result in another exile. 
as implicit in Zechariah 11. You'll see more in Zechariah 13. Okay, so so because of time, I cannot go into a more detailed explanation of this, but just, just give you an idea how uh, accurate Matthew is when he quoted and when he say when he when he say what he said. Now, why quote Je why why say Jeremiah? Since he 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 put together the prophecy of Zechariah and Jeremiah, but he only attributed to Jeremiah. Look at Mark 1 2. We see the same phenomenon happening. Mark 1 2 says, as it, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Now, Mark here is quoting a prophecy from Isaiah as well as from Malachi and combine them into one. And I highlighted there. The first one, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare my ways from Malachi 3.1. The voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way is from Isaiah 40. So he combined two prophecies from two prophets into one and he attributed to just one, Isaiah, the more well-known one, as is written in Isaiah. So you see, this is the practice of uh, the gospel writers when they combine two or more prophecies into one they will attribute to the one that is more famous so matthew combined a prophecy not literally quotation but allusion from Zechariah and from jeremiah combined to one and then attribute to jeremiah okay so solve the problem that is a major problem by the way of how the new testament could the old testament what we have just seen it's one of the most difficult to explain. So uh, I, I don't know how far I've gone in terms of how you understand what I'm trying to say. It's the most difficult one. I've tried my best in a short time in the context of uh, studying Zechariah to show you how Matthew did not quote out of context. I trust the New Testament writers when they quote the Old Testament. I have worked through this and I've seen, I have worked out a pattern of how they actually quote and they don't quote out of context. And therefore, therefore, I confidently attribute Zechariah 9, 11, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 to Jesus Christ based on the quotation from the New Testament. I trust that they quote not out of context, they quote according to what the text actually means. Okay, so we have just seen an illustration. Let's move on. This is the most difficult part. Now, I mentioned right in the beginning that Usually, the prophets combine the first and second coming of Christ into one. Now, for example, you read Isaiah, you will never get the idea that Christ will come two times. In fact, you read Isaiah, you get the impression that Christ will come during Persian time. But Daniel made it very clear it's not Persian time coming, Roman time, the fourth kingdom after Babylon, Persia, you know, Greek, and then Roman. So, but Isaiah is not wrong. He did not say when he come, but just the impression you get, but it's clarified by Daniel. S is about the suffering of Christ. G is about the glory of Christ. Christ said the suffering must precede the glory. And Isaiah presented as though it's one thing. His suffering his glory come, you know, together in one coming, no two comings. That is the impression we get. He's not wrong. He just didn't spell out the details. But from Daniel 9, Zechariah 11, we can see that there are two coming. He stretched it out. The circle stretch out. Daniel 9 says the Messiah will die before the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Now, re recognize that when Daniel wrote that, you see, Daniel was in exile. When Daniel wrote that, Jerusalem had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed by the Babylonian. So when Daniel 9 talk about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, it's a future one. Not the Babylonian one, the future one. And he says, Christ will come before that. And uh, basically, to bring atonement, Daniel 9. When you combine Daniel 9, Isaiah 53, the Messiah will come to bring atonement. He will die for the sin of his people. And Daniel 9 say that will happen before Jerusalem is destroyed and temple destroyed. We know from history that happened in AD 70. That means the Messiah must come before AD 70. And Christ came before that. He died. Before AD 70, he died in AD 30. So 40 years later, 
what Daniel said came is fulfilled. Okay? So in other words, Daniel included the D, destruction. After the suffering of Christ, there's a destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And Zechariah 11, hinted just now, exile. Not eat flesh and so on. There's another exile. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple happened in AD 70. The exile of the Jews happened in AD 135. There was another revolt. The Romans are so fed up, came down and climbed down and they were scattered. That's why the Jews were scattered over all, all, Europe, all over Europe. Christ himself predicted because they rejected him, they will, the temple will be destroyed and they will be scattered. Okay? And the glory of Christ will be at the second coming. So, Daniel 9 and Zechariah 11 give us a better picture of the coming of the Messiah, the last days. The last days cover the first and second coming of Christ. The whole stretch. So Isaiah talked about the last days. S and G together. Last days. But with Daniel 9 and Zechariah 11, we stretch it out to the first and second coming of Christ. And this is confirmed in the New Testament. There's a second coming of Christ. Suffering, comfort, and then glory. Christ's first coming is for salvation. Speak peace. Second coming will be judgment. Okay, so this will give us a get better understanding of uh, the prophetic books. So this will help us understand the other prophetic books. So all of them generally do not give us an idea there are two comings. Only in Daniel 9 11 it qualifies. So in the Old Testament itself, there are indications that the Messiah will come twice. Okay, let's move on. Chapter 12. On that day, the day of the Lord that we talked about last year in Zephaniah and Joel, the day of the Lord, second coming of Christ, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. No longer speak peace, speak war. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on whom, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Who is speaking here? The I is the Lord. I will pour out and they will look on him, on me, on him who will be pierced. And, and, and the Bible scholars have big problem with this, even Christian ones, you know. How can you pierce God? Again, that is not allowing the New Testament to help us. Who is it that on him whom they are pierced, they shall mourn? Now, in other words, he's talking about at the second coming of Christ, when, when, they, when Christ will destroy the nations, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the nation of Israel, will look on him whom they have pierced and shall mourn. That means they will repent and turn to Christ. So who is him whom they will pierce? John quoted this. John 19.37 says, and again another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Okay? So in other words, John identifies the him whom he pierced in Zechariah 12 as Jesus Christ. After the soldier pierced Christ's side, whom they are pierced. And Revelation 1 7, behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will veil on account of him. Zechariah only talks about those in Jerusalem. But Revelation said, all the tribes of the earth, even those who pierce him. So these two New Testament, Testament texts, both by John. In John and Gospel of John and Revelation, identify the Him whom they pierce as God Himself, that is the Messiah. So, chapter 12 already predicted that the Messiah of God will be pierced, fulfilled at His crucifixion. And it predicts that one day the nation of Israel will see this and mourn and turn to Christ. And the whole earth will also see him. Predicted in Revelation. Can we believe this will happen? That is the whole point of Zechariah. 
God is relentless, unrelenting in fulfilling what he said he would do. Okay? Let's move on to chapter 13. Next slide. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they will be remembered no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, you shall not live for you speak lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who bore him shall pierce him through. Same word when he prophesies. In other words, on that day, there will be cleanse of the sin. There's a fountain and no more idols. False worship, no more false prophecy. So there will be cleanse of sin, no more false worship, no more false teaching. Has this been fulfilled? Well, the church experienced this. We have, to. of course, the church includes the Jews, not just Gentiles. The early church was basically Jewish. So we are not separating Israel and Gentiles. The church means Jews and Gentiles. Initially, it was all Jews, then at the Gentiles. And then Gentiles overwhelmed mainly. And then one day, the nation of Israel, whoa, repent and mourn. We saw just now in chapter 12 and become part of the church. So we are not talking about church versus Israel. Israel will become the church. And there are Jews already part of the church today. Okay, now, this of course built on the remove the iniquity. Okay, but now, look further down. Next slide, chapter 13. Away, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me. A man close to me, that means someone close to God, not just any man. His associates, and the only person who fit that bill is the Messiah who is God himself. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put his, this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Now this quoted in Matthew 29. 26 verse 3, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now, concerning uh, the scattering of the disciples when Christ is arrested. Again, the New Testament help us. Who is this shepherd? The Messiah. Strike. Strike dead. Now, in the context of there is a fountain for cleansing. In the context of God will take away iniquity one day. The iniquity will be taken away and so on. So it will happen when the shepherd is struck, the death of the shepherd. So in other words, this is about the death of Christ to take away iniquity. And this is quoted in the context of Christ being arrested and they be put to death on the cross. Now, it was applied to the scattering of the disciples as Christ is uh, arrested. But in this context, it goes beyond that. It is about two thirds they cut them. So that, that is the language of exile. If you go to Ezekiel, talking about exile, you know, the, 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 his head will divide into three parts. You know, one part will be the part that will be the remnant. Here again, the one part will be refined. They will become God's people. In other words, he's talking about the exile under the Romans. This go hand in hand with what he saw just now, 11. I say it will be clarified here. So Zechariah 11 and 13 predicted another exile. And it was fulfilled in AD 137. The scattering, the sheep will be scattered because they have no shepherd, they will be scattered. It was applied to the scattering of initial disciples, but actually it has a bigger application, the scattering of the nation, exile, to the, what we read just now in verses 8 to 9. Okay, so Zechariah predicted the Roman exile. What happened in AD 137? Daniel 9 predicted the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Okay, let's look at the last chapter, chapter 14. 
Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst, and I will gather all the nation against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go into exile, and the rest of the people shall not be shall not be cut off from the city. And the Lord will go out and fight against the nation as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies between Jerusalem, before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split into two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half move southward. How to make sense of it? Again, we use the New Testament. Acts one eleven say, just as Christ was lifted up from the Mount of Olives, he shall come back. So this is talking about Christ's second coming and land on Mount Olives. Now this is also the battle that we saw just now in chapter 12. How uh, will be triumphant. Okay? Now, here it mentioned that Jerusalem will have an initial setback, but ultimately will be triumphant. Now, uh, I'll come back to this later on. What we focus on is when Christ comes back, his feet land on the Mount Olives, the, 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 the mountain was split into two and moved. In other words, something is going to happen to the very structure of the, of the earth. I mean, how are we going to make sense of this? Let's move on to the next slide. On that day, living water shall flow out of Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. We shall continue in summer as in winter, continuously. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. The eyes will rot in the sockets and their tongue will rot in the mouth. It's very unusual death. And everyone who survives of all the nation that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booth and on that day they shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses holy to the lord everything were holy now how to make sense of the text just now and here we know it's about christ's second coming and here living water shall flow out of jerusalem revelation 22 verses 92 the new jerusalem living water will flow out also in ezekiel where you see the tree of life for healing and the Lord will finally king all the earth. So he's talking about the new Jerusalem. Second coming, new Jerusalem. So if we allow the New Testament to help us, then it makes sense. Otherwise, we cannot figure out what he's talking about. Okay? And uh, so that part is clear. What about their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet? And those who survive will go and worship God, practice the feast of booth just like you know in the old testament well we want to take isaiah to help us look at the last slide isaiah isaiah was prophesying 150 years even before the exile isaiah 56 now isaiah 53 is about the death of the messiah 54 is about the spread of the gospel 55 is about you know come to the lord by what is Get, salvation is free, repent and so on. 56 says, Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, I will bring to my holy mountain. Their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Now, has this been fulfilled? Foreigners will, who join the Lord will, will go to the Holy Mountain and offer sacrifices in Jerusalem. Look at the first verse, the context, when it's fulfilled. My salvation will come, my righteousness will be revealed. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 7? The gospel is the power of salvation, right? And the righteousness of God has been revealed. He was obviously referring to this verse. Isaiah was predicting that the coming of God's salvation, the good news, the gospel, Isaiah 40 onwards, the coming of the gospel, the 
coming of salvation, the coming of God's righteousness to be revealed. And Paul said, my salvation, uh, uh, Paul said, the gospel is salvation has come and God's righteousness has been revealed. So this has been fulfilled. But foreigners like us Gentiles do not worship in the temple. What does that mean? You see in the Old Testament, foreigners cannot go in the temple. And you not, this text mentioned you not also. To be able to enter the temple worship means they're God's people. So in other words, this text is saying that foreigners, Gentiles, will also be God's people. The temple, God's house, will be for all peoples, not only for the Jews, Israelites. In the Old Testament, it's only for the Israelites. Gentiles cannot go into the courtyard, even the courtyard, the tabernacle, or the temple. So when you talk about foreigners will also go into the temple and worship burn sacrifices, that means Gentiles will also be God's people. So this is how we understand. In other words, we need to understand the salvation that Christ brings in terms of Old Testament. In the Old Testament, how did they become God's people? They worship in the Jerusalem temple. So worship in Jerusalem temple means become God's people. So what it means is, when God's righteousness has been revealed, Paul says in Romans 1, Gentiles will also become God's people. So this helps us understand just now we mentioned that there are people who will go to the temple and also observe the Feast of Booth. That means in the end times, when Christ comes back, there are, there are people who survive, will become God's people. What about those who, will, who, who die standing in their eyes, uh, you know, and so on. Chapter 60, Isaiah chapter 63, verse 4. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I poured out their life's blood on the earth. For as the new heavens and the new earth, and new Jerusalem, that I will make shall remain before me, so shall your offspring. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who are, have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, and their fire shall not quench. And we know Christ quoted this and refers to hell. And it is in the context of the new heaven and new, new Jerusalem. So Isaiah 66 is talking about heaven and hell. And the dead bodies from where? From the Messiah, the day of vengeance going out to trample down on people in anger and slaughter them, pour out their blood on the earth. That means Isaiah presents hell, the final judgment, in terms of a slaughter, in terms of these people being put to death. That will help us explain just now what we saw in Zechariah, that they will die standing. Their eyes will rot, their tongues will rot. That refers to hell. Day of vengeance, 63, referring to hell. So in other words, Isaiah is presenting hell using the language of the past conquest. Remember, they, they go into Canaan, they are to destroy the Canaanites. What does that mean? Because that land is going to be holy land. God is going to dwell with them through the tabernacle and later the temple. It's holy land. So they are going to possess that. That is the redemption of the Israelite under the Mosaic covenant. Because the land is going to be holy, all the Canaanites must be driven out, must be destroyed. In other words, there can be no redemption for God to dwell in them to be the holy land if there's no destruction, there's no judgment on those who should not be in there. Put it differently, there can be no heaven without hell. There's a new Jerusalem, new heaven and new earth, but there must be hell. Their worm shall not die, fire shall not be quenched. Because where do they go? In the new heaven and new earth, Everywhere, the whole universe, whole earth belongs to God. It's a new heaven and a new earth. It's heaven. There is no unrighteousness. So there must be hell. Therefore, God's wrath. Remember I mentioned God's wrath? When God demonstrates His love to bring redemption, to, to bring us to heaven, when there is heaven, new Jerusalem, new heaven, new earth, there must be hell. And Hell is the result of God's wrath in judging sinners. So God's wrath is needed to bring about heaven. Because if there's no wrath of God, there's no hell. If there's no hell, 
There is no heaven. In the same way, God's wrath has to destroy the Canaanites so that there is holy land. There can be no holy land without the destruction of the Canaanites. Day of vengeance and also the year of redemption. So with this, we understand Zechariah 14. is talking about heaven and hell. Okay, now, I mentioned about the war. It can be understood in terms of spiritually. If at this point, and the destruction need not be a physical war, it could be spiritually God destroying sinners. So we don't have to read it physically. This is the best we can make of it, Zechariah, based on the whole Old Testament, the whole Bible, New Testament, based on what has been fulfilled and look forward to what has not been fulfilled. Okay, so we have covered the whole book of Zechariah and uh, you can see Zechariah is basically about the coming of Christ, the first and second coming of Christ, presenting a very, very meaningful message. Okay, so it's 10 o'clock. I think we have some time. Uh, since uh, it's Zoom, you know, in church you have to drive home, you see? So in uh, Zoom, you don't have to drive home. So you drive home for question and answer. Okay. Yeah, we want to thank uh, Dr. Leong for uh, sharing with us the overview of uh, the book of Zechariah. And I also want to thank uh, everyone for staying back for the whole uh, solid two hours listening to him. So, yeah. So now is the time uh, that uh, Dr. Leong opens for anyone to have any Q&A or anything that you are not clear. Uh, if so, uh, could you unmute yourself and uh, show your video so that he knows who he's talking to? Thank you. Anyone? Remember to unmute, huh? Okay, looks like none. Okay, uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Leong, if any last word to say. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have read through or studied Zechariah. So, uh, and uh, I know the whole range of us, some of us have no idea there is even Zechariah in the Bible. I don't think anybody like that, but there are some of us are more familiar. So what I what I've tried to do is to, to cater to the needs of everyone. So, Hopefully, everyone will, will, will understand something. Though those of us who are more familiar with Old Testament and with the prophetic book will understand more. Those of us who are, have less familiarity will understand less. So this is my way of trying to cater to everybody. So, uh, so for those of us who find it a bit more difficult, I hope you understand at least something so that uh, uh, starting to begin to understand and appreciate the prophetic books including the minor prophets and Zechariah. So, so it, because uh, it is a very rare occasion that the, uh, I know, this is the first time I taught the book of Zechariah. After 40 years of ministry, this is the first time I taught Zechariah. So you see how much it is neglected. So that's why I want to make full use of these two hours to take us, you know, as far as possible within two hours so that those of us who are more familiar can get most of our, out of it. So those of us who don't get as much, I hope you get at least something. Okay. And since there's no question, I, <laughs> so, so I, I, I suppose that, uh, that we, we... Yeah, Elder Eileen Eileen has some... Uh, yeah. Some I, yeah, I'm Eileen. Huh? Just want to <clears throat> ask Dr. Leong, you see, why, why is God's word so complicated to understand for this part? Like, no, it's not an easy book. And why, why, why not make it simple for people to understand and, you know, and the, the visions, the symbols, and, the, and talking about the sons of new oil, and then the lamb stamps, the symbols of the woman in the basket, and the branch. Why don't make it, why, why is the Old Testament, the, the wordings make it so, and then the, the, the symbols especially, and the, the interpretation of, of of such symbols okay. by, by us and by, by speakers. Okay. First of all, 
<coughs> we find it more difficult than what the original hearers will find, partly because of the language. We have to read the translation. And no one today has native language of the Hebrew use. So we have to figure out what the Hebrew actually means. So that complicates the, difficult, the thing, okay? The linguistic difference. So we have to read the translation and the translator may not even understand what the Hebrew actually says. So that is a major reason why we find it difficult because we are not the original, the original hearers who understand it better. Um, secondly, the cultural context. For example, uh, say suddenly someone give you a newspaper. Uh, it's in English, even though it's English, but it reports something in Russia. You really know head and tail. But someone who have lived in Russia and know Russia really can understand it. You see, there's another reason why we find it so difficult. We don't have the proper context to understand it. The cultural difference, the historical difference. Okay, so that is another reason. And thirdly, we are not as fluent as the original audience is expected in terms of the Old Testament, the language, the, the framework, you see. So, the, the, for example, uh, I don't know whether uh, when, they, when Zechariah said branch, they, they, I suppose they understand it because of Jeremiah. So, so one reason why we find it difficult, Zechariah, is, for example, you have not studied Isaiah, Jeremiah, then what is branch? Once you study Isaiah, Jeremiah, branch is very straightforward. Once you see, oh, Messiah. See, so in other words, the Old Testament will be easier and easier when we read it more and more. Keep reading it. The problem is, Old Testament is not like New Testament. It's so thick. New Testament is one third. So, so to really understand. That's why I mentioned that we read Zechariah, we are thinking in terms of the whole Bible, whole text and so on. So, so in other words, if we are not familiar with the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament, then we find it more difficult. Now, because the Bible is so thick, and God knows that uh, not everyone will be able to understand. That's why God gave uh, to the church teachers, spiritual gift, and, and some of us are called full-time as Bible teachers and so on. To teach. So, so in other words, the very fact that God gives different people different gifts, different callings, so that, you know, God understands that there's difficulty. And uh, one reason why we have this session at all is so that those of us like me who are, who are called to study can enlighten us to give us some tips how to go about understanding it. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Also because, uh, as Jesus himself said, why he speak in parable? He doesn't want everyone to understand it. So, to God revealing this the way, also to show that only those who are determined to know God's word, who want God's word, will understand it. Are we willing to pay the price? Do we really believe that it is God's word? If we believe God's word, we will pay the price. For example, you know, like we have a session tonight, come to a session like this. So if you don't care, then, you know, when the opportunity arises, don't even bother to, you know, even on Zoom, no need to go anywhere to attend a session like this. So, so all this comes into the picture. So I hope that answers the question. And of course, I'm not able to put myself in the original situation to know that how much more difficult we are now. If you were there, how much less difficult I cannot answer the, answer the question. But I can share that it will be much easier for them than for us, for the reason I've given. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yong, for the explanation. I hope it answers your, your question, uh, really. <laughs> Okay, is there anyone? Yes, William, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yong, I just want to ask, uh, a lot of what Prophet Zechariah is talking is about the future. It's, on the second coming of Christ. So what relevance is it to the people hearing that message at that time? For example, in Revelation, you know that uh, John, Apostle John, when he uh, 
gives prophecies on revolution, the people at that time were going through great persecution and they were suffering. So what John taught gave the people hope for the future that in the future there will be justice because they are they're going through a lot of suffering and injustice at that time. But for the people in uh, Zechariah's time, what is it for them? Okay. Uh, do they get encouragement from uh, his prophecy? Okay, sure. That was meant to encourage them. That, that was what I highlighted just now. That God said, you know, I did not relent in terms of judgment. I will not relent in terms of blessing the Jerusalem. So that is also in the context of them uh, living in difficult times under Persian Empire, still build, rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the Jerusalem. So they are uh, supposed to look forward to the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. That is to encourage them. Of course, uh, they did not know their true coming of Messiah. So, so to them is encouragement. So, so they should wait and also to prepare them when the Messiah comes to accept him. But sure enough, they did not accept him. So the very fact that the Messiah is coming to bring salvation should be encouragement to them. And in fact, there's a highlight both in Haggai and Zechariah. They say, you know, do not despise small things. You see, when the temple is rebuilt, it's very small compared to the Solomon temple. They actually wept when the older people saw, you know, the, 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 the foundation is so small. The temple that they, they used to know, you know Jerusalem, the, the Solomon temple is so big, so glorious. The one that rebuilt is so small. And God said, the temple will be bigger. And we know this temple will be the church. So it will be encouragement to them from where they are. Even though they don't know it will be a second coming, like we know now. To them, the Messiah is coming. God will bless Jerusalem. It's a, it, it is a, it is an encouragement to them. And the Messiah did come. The problem is they did not accept the Messiah. If they had accepted the Messiah, the history will be different. And I, 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 and I mentioned, I did not highlight enough that Jesus himself said, because they rejected the Messiah, they will be exiled, Jerusalem will be destroyed. You see, you look back in the history, you know, we talk about hypothetical, look back at the history. Why did the Romans uh, attack Jerusalem? They destroyed the temple. They did not actually want to destroy it, end up destroying the temple. They want to capture Jerusalem to punish them. And then they were exiled in Montreal, 5 BC, because they rebelled against the Romans. They rebelled against the Romans. Now, if they have accepted the Messiah, if they are Christian like us, would they rebel against the Romans? No. Jesus taught us not to use violence. Paul said, the Roman, they are God's servants. So Christians will not rebel against the Roman Empire. So if they have accepted the Messiah, they will not rebel. If they do not rebel, they, there will be no destruction of Jerusalem again. They will not be scattering. So, you see, that is their hope. But then they rejected. And Zechariah already predicted they would reject. And it, 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 and, and it, it came to pass. So, what is relevant to them? When Jesus come and when Jerusalem destroyed, the Jews would have realized, would have realized that Zechariah come to pass, they should turn to the Messiah. I mean, they didn't. Perhaps some Jews did. They have to wait till the second coming of Christ. You see? So, it will be a blessing to them in difficult time. They didn't know what we know. Even though Zechariah predicted that they will reject and so on. It's kind of warning, warning them so that, so that they will believe in the future more, what God has said. But we know that uh, one day at the second coming, you know, we, we don't know what it is, the gathering of the nation or this thing, how it happened, we don't know. So one thing I want to mention is this. Concerning prophecy, and concerning the future, we know what will happen. We do not know exactly how it will happen. I'll give you an example. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14, they say, you know, the virgin will be with child and you will call him Emmanuel, right? So when Mary was with child, did he call him Emmanuel? In fact, the angel Gabriel said, call him Jesus. So is the prophecy fulfilled? Yes and no. You see, the name in the Bible need not be the name we call one another. It could remember the character, who, who, who the person is. So Emmanuel means who God is. But his name is actually Jesus, but he's God, God with us. So when he's fulfilled, ah, oh, yeah, we know he's fulfilled. But before he's fulfilled, we will guess wrongly that he will be called Emmanuel, but it's not Emmanuel, Jesus. Another example, 
is uh, remember Agabus the prophet warned the people and Paul. Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem in Acts 21. We go to Jerusalem to bring the, the, the money that he raised in the Macedonia and uh, to, to the Jews in Jerusalem. And the uh, prophet Agabus say, Well, you know, this is what will happen in, in, in Paul goes to Jerusalem. He take Paul's belt and tie his hand and leg and say, you know, uh, this is what happened. The Jews will do this to the person who this belt. In other words, the Jews will tie Paul's hand and leg and hand him over to the Gentiles. That is the prophecy of Agabus. But when Paul was actually arrested, what, what happened? Same chapter 21. When Paul was in the temple and, uh, and there were Jews from the part where Paul used to preach at, in Jerusalem at that time. And these Jews create a big havoc and they begin to beat Paul. And the Romans came and kind of delivered Paul and the Romans bound him. So there are scholars who say, well, the prophecy made a mistake. That's not how exactly it happened. You see, but if you look at prophecy in the Old Testament, this very principle is this. The prophecy when it's about the future, we can know what will happen. We may not know exactly how it's happened, especially when it's symbolic. When it is symbolic, exactly how it happened, we don't know. We know what will happen. In other words, what will happen is Paul will be put into custody to the Gentile because of the Jews. The Jews caused Paul to be under custody by Gentiles. That was exactly what happened. Because of the Jews, Paul was arrested by the Romans. Fulfill the prophecy. Exactly. In terms of what will happen, not the details, how he's bound and so on, it's symbolic. In the same way about the, the battle and all, gathering the nation, all these things, we know God will judge the nations. That's what we know. Exactly how will there be a literal battle, all these things? We don't know. And I guess it's not a literal battle, but it's used in terms of battle so that the Jews can understand. Why did Isaiah say, you know, uh, when God's righteousness is revealed, the, the, the foreigners, Gentile, will go to worship in the temple? Because that is their way to understand what it means to be people of God. To tell them what is people of God or people of God worship in the temple. Say they worship the temple, they understand people of God. Otherwise, how to tell the Jews in Isaiah's time that Gentiles will become people of God? The best way to say they will worship in the temple. Even though there is not exactly what will happen. But what will happen is Gentiles become God's people. We know what will happen. Exactly how? Worship in the temple? No. So, in the same way, how Paul is uh, uh, bound it's not exact, but we know he will be captured. So in the same way, those languages about war and all these things, gathering the nations against Jerusalem, what we know is this, God will judge the nations. Exactly how? Wait for it to happen. We will know it only when it happened, then we know exactly how it happened. Like how Paul is arrested, we know when it happened. How Gentile become God's people, we know. You know, we don't go to Jerusalem temple. You know, we become Christian and we go to church. <laughs> Okay. So okay. Yeah. So thank you, Doctor Young, once again. Huh? Okay. Uh, all the questions are interesting, and uh, because of time factor, uh, I think we shall, uh, okay. you know, yeah, call it a day. And uh, while we wait for for the closing, uh, may I ask uh, Elder Eileen to close us with, with the prayer? And uh, just for information of uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, this uh, Doctor Young will be speaking uh, in the church, uh, I mean, uh, uh, virtually, uh, he, will be, he has a recorded sermon, yeah. Okay, see you in church, uh, okay, come and listen to his message. Okay, Elder Ali, uh, close us with prayer, thank you. Father, indeed, we are so thankful to you, Lord, that you have brought us, brought us together to, to study uh, on this book of Zechariah. We thank you for Dr. Leong, your servant, a faithful servant, is expounded and to, to share with us his expertise of, of uh, interpreting uh, this, this book. Though, though time is so short, uh, two hours, Lord, he, he has covered so much, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, that you, you, have, you have blessed him with that gift, Lord. And each and every one of us have certain gifts that you have given to us. To be not only for ourselves, we ought to be shared among others. So we thank you, Lord, for our, your faithful servant, Dr. Leong, as he continues to serve you, Lord, in this manner, Lord, to, to share your word with all others, Lord. We pray that, Father, as we have learned, 
briefly about the, this book. We pray that, Lord, you will help us to understand even further. We want to commit ourselves to you the, tonight as we dismiss ourselves, Lord. We pray that you will be with us and grant us a good night's rest and sleep for tomorrow's uh, uh, preparation for service. We also want to pray that you will use your servant, uh, Dr. Leong, to speak to us, Lord, during the worship service. And all preparations for worship, Lord, we pray that the team and all the worship uh, uh, uh Team, Lord, will lead us into a time of worship of you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for tonight. We pray that, Lord, dismiss us, Lord, with your blessings as we ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leong, once again, yeah, for spending the two and a half hours almost. Yeah, thank you very much. See you tomorrow, yeah, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.